Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Pictorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. They are the NFL's oldest team. Only three families have ever owned the franchise. They compiled one of the worst records for an entire decade in football history, and yet they had a coach for whom a stadium is now named. They shared the same city as two other professional football franchises, but perhaps they played on the wrong side of town, which ultimately played a key factor in their moving and relocating. Next, on Sports Forgotten Heroes, the story of the Chicago Cardinals. This is Sports Forgotten Heroes, a tribute to the stars who shape the games we love to watch and the games we love to play. Stars who provided us with many thrills, but when their time was up, they faded away. We'll take a look back at their spectacular careers, their moments of fame, even if it was just for one season or just one game. And now, here's your host, Warren Rogan. Hello and welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes, episode number 88, the Chicago Cardinals. Yep, for those too young to remember or for those of you who just plain forgot, the Arizona Cardinals are actually the oldest franchise in professional football along with the Chicago Bears. Both were a part of the NFL's inaugural season in 1920 when the league was known as the American Professional Football Association. After failing to gain a sustainable following in 1960, the Cardinals packed up with the aid of the NFL and relocated to St. Louis. Of course, things went south in St. Louis as well, and in 1988, the team moved west to Phoenix, where they were first known as the Phoenix Cardinals and later changed their name to the Arizona Cardinals. But while in Chicago the Cardinals celebrated some really terrific seasons, namely 1925, 1947, and 1948. They had some of the game's greatest, Patty Driscoll, Ernie Nevers, Charlie Trippi, Ollie Matson, and Duke Slater. But there were so many down years, and Playing on the south side of town as opposed to playing on the north side of town certainly affected the Cardinals' ability to draw fans and sustain enough of a following for the team to remain in Chicago. And of course, the Bears had great successes early on, but a passionate following captured the heart of the city for the Bears. Joining me on today's show to talk about the Chicago Cardinals is Joe Zemba. His father was once signed by the Chicago Cardinals, and as time went on, and after Joe's father had passed, Joe decided to find out more about the team who had signed his father, and that ultimately led to the publishing of the book, When Football Was Football, The Chicago Cardinals and the Birth of the NFL. Joe has probably forgotten more about the Chicago Cardinals than any of us ever knew, or any of us ever know right now. Even better, Joe speaks about his Chicago Cardinals with a passion unlike many have for any subject they love. To learn more about Joe's book, visit sportsfh.com. There I have links to the book, notes about Joe, and links to more information about the Chicago Cardinals. In fact, I have archives about all of the shows I have done. That's sportsfh.com. You can also send in comments, ask questions, or make suggestions for future topics. Remember, you can also follow Sports Forgotten Heroes on Twitter at SportsFHeroes. 
Check out the Sports Forgotten Heroes page on Facebook or follow Sports Forgotten Heroes on Instagram as well. And of course, if you are listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave a five-star rating. And as always, thanks for listening. Okay, the Chicago Cardinals. You know, they won a championship in 1925, but didn't accept it until years later. And they won again in 1947, a title they immediately celebrated. The 1950s, they were awful. They couldn't draw and ultimately packed up and left town for St. Louis. And here to talk about the Chicago Cardinals is Joe Zembo. Joe, welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes. Glad you could be here. Warren, really appreciate it. And what a great opportunity to talk about my favorite subject that a lot of people don't know about, the Chicago Cardinals, the NFL's oldest team. Yeah, it's it, it really is a uh, a wonderful subject. I guess let's start with... Tell me about your interest in the Cardinals, the Chicago Cardinals, and why you're so passionate about their history. I became aware of the Cardinals as a kid because I found out that my father had been drafted by the team in the 1940s. Mm. And the funny thing about it, he never mentioned it. And people would come up to him. I remember being really young and say, oh, his name was also Joe. Hey, Big Joe. Hey, how you doing these days? And these giant men uh, <laughs> that were pro football players would know him. And he, he seemed to know everybody in the city of Chicago. But what intrigued me was finding his contract. He passed away fairly early, unfortunately. But I had a box of his stuff for years and years and years. And never really looked into it until I moved one time in the uh, probably the early to mid 90s. Mm -hmm. And I found this contract, which was so unique. He got drafted by the Cardinals and he signed this uh, contract for one hundred and ten dollars a game. But the players at that time had to provide their own shoes and shoulder pads. And that just got me <laughs> thinking. Wow, what a difference uh, from football today. The players, of course, played both ways. We know that now. But the fact that they really had to have part-time jobs, not only during the season, but, of course, after the season to survive. And I wanted to find out more about what happened to him. He went to training camp, uh, apparently got injured his knee that he had hurt in college. Today would be a minor arthroscopic procedure, I think. But because he was going to have the surgery, he said he can make more money coaching high school football than he could playing professional football. So we left camp. <laughs> but that kind of started my drive to find out more about the Cardinals. And it really culminated when my book was being prepared and I got to attend one of the Cardinal reunions they, they used to have. And Billy Duell, who was the star of the 1947 championship team, specifically remembered my dad being in training camp and that he was going to be on the roster. He said, really, too bad he got hurt. He really would have helped us. Mm. And so that made my search just feel so good, like I had found out what happened, that my dad made a decision and he stuck to it. Um, but there was another part of the story was once I started looking about him, I thought, man, this might be worth something because there really was not a full-length book about the Chicago Cardinals. Mm -hmm. There was one about when they were in St. Louis, and there's been, of course, a lot of articles and newspaper articles over the years about the team, but not a full-length book. Mm -hmm. So that got me going, and uh, a thing that really kind of prompted me was being in a shop in downtown Chicago, and they were selling vintage hats, and one was a, a retro hat from the 1947 Cardinals, and it had a little tag on, and talked about the dream backfield and mm -hmm. how the team won the championship. And I thought, I'm really going to explore this. And so I bought the hat, put the tag in my pocket, forgot about it, of course. Mm. Then one day I said, eh, maybe I'll look into this. And that kind of started the old snowball down the mountain, mm -hmm. uh, looking into the team, finding out about the team, and then just so much fun information about those guys and what they went through for all those years. And mm -hmm. so the passion was personal. It still is a little bit, but I found myself kind of hooked on it now to where 
I have no life. I look up Cardinal <laughs> stuff all the time. <laughs> How difficult was it to, I don't know, unearth some of the information about the Cardinals? Well, I thought the easiest thing to do would be to ask the Cardinals themselves about the history, and they were very gracious about it. I spent a lot of time with uh, Bill Bidwell, who passed mm. away mm-hmm. recently. Mm-hmm. Very gracious, wonderful guy. He spent couple, three long sessions w- with me, but it turns out the Cardinals, and I believe the Bears are in the same situation, had all these old records that were lost in a fire, maybe in the 50s. Mm. And so uh, I had to go back and start recreating things using the old-fashioned microfilm mm. down at the uh, Chicago History Museum, which is a, a great place to do research. And then I started finding errors Uh, to what was published about the team. Not that anyone would care. Again, I have no life. It meant something to me. (laughs) Sort (laughs) of like me. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, finding out some of that information and correcting it and digging into old newspapers, it was uh, something I enjoyed. I was working in downtown Chicago at the time, so I had lunchtime access where I could zip over and do some research at a museum and and uh, pick away at it for a long time. It took about seven years of research, mm, and my mm-hmm. wife finally said, quit researching and write the book. So that's what I did. Mm. The boss told me, and uh, and then uh, Triumph Books in Chicago was kind enough to publish it. And so I was uh, real happy with the way it turned out many, many years ago. Good for you. Before we really dive in deep on the Chicago Cardinals, I was wondering if you might be able to – paint a little picture of what the landscape of professional football was like back in 1920. It was pretty dire at the time. Of course, the colleges were the big thing. And especially in Chicago, the university of Chicago, which had doesn't, doesn't really have a major team anymore. They do have a team it was one of the powerhouses in the big 10. It was just called or the, uh, the Western conference. And so the attendance was really a struggle. The Cardinals played at a little small neighborhood baseball field called Normal Park Mm -hmm. at 61st and Racine in Chicago, where the owner of the team or manager, Chris O'Brien, would triple up as a ticket seller, uh, the manager of the team, Mm. uh, sell concessions. His granddaughters told me that they remember when he would – go up and down in the basement of the concession stand and bring a pop and candy to, to sell during a the game, then run over to the sidelines, make sure the players had tape or whatever they needed. But uh, the Bears weren't in Chicago yet in 1920. They were starting out in Decatur, of course. So the Cardinals had the uh, city to themselves in terms of professional football. There was another team called the Chicago Tigers that played up uh, – in what became Wrigley Field, where the Cubs play, and the Bears took over eventually. But then there was a a nice organization that had been around for about 20 years called the Chicago Football League, which was the semi-pro teams, and there were tons of them. I think uh, well over 150 teams in Chicago. These were the Sandlot or Prairie teams that would play, and if you wanted to donate uh, to the the cause, they would accept your money and play in a roped-off field. But uh, at the time, college football and, of course, Major League Baseball were the major sports uh, around Mm. Chicago at the time. So it took a while for them to really generate some big crowds, although when the Decatur Staley's moved to Chicago or started playing, then the rivalry with the Cardinals began. And that seemed to draw a little bit more fan interest, much like the White Sox and the Cubs on Mm -hmm. the south side and north side. The Cardinals were south, the Bears or the Staley's were north. And that generated some enthusiasm from the fans in in the Chicago area. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you mentioned Chris O'Brien and the fact that he did all that work, you know, uh, took care of the stadium, the sales, all that reminds me of Leo Lyons, one of the founders of the NFL, who we who I did a uh, podcast on, uh, you know, last football season. Yeah. Um, Who were the racing normals that was the cardinals as well and to give you a little background of how the team got organized in 1899 chris o'brien his brother and another guy named tom clancy were teenagers and they started a team called the morgan athletic association and 
later on, the team a year later became part of what was called the Morgan Athletic Club. Mm -hmm. This is again where I found some disparities in the in the history of the team. That in 1899, the athletic association started, which became part of an athletic club. And athletic clubs provided their members with a lot of social opportunities from dances to um, running races, boxing matches, all sorts of things that they could do. And the bigger clubs sponsored baseball and football teams. And through the years, the O'Brien brothers uh, were part of the Morgan Athletic Club as well as a normal athletic association. And then in 1916, a new corporation started called the Racing Cardinals Social and Pleasure Club. And I can't make that name up. (laughs) (laughs) Based out of Chris O'Brien's house. And so the Racing Cardinals took their name from the street called Racine Avenue. And which was common again with a lot of those early teams in Chicago would take the name of the street. The Aberdeens, the Peorias, the Westerns, Mm -hmm. uh, these were the names of the teams that played in the local Mm -hmm. Chicago Football League. And so the Racing Cardinals uh, took their name uh, as part of the athletic club uh, based on Racing Street. And so the Racing Cardinals were the immediate predecessor to the Chicago Cardinals, and the team did not change its name until a club from Racing, Wisconsin started also called the Racing Cardinals. In fact, the first minutes of the NFL in 1920, if you ever get a chance to check those out, it'll list the Racine Wisconsin Cardinals as one of the original members, which, of Mm. course, was the Racine Chicago Cardinals. Mm -hmm. So, all right, so here's the first uh, conflict that that I come across. So you're saying um, that the Cardinals got their name because of the name of the street, I was under the impression that the Cardinals got their name because of the color of the uniform of the racing normals. And it had nothing to do with the bird. Rather, it had to do with the color of the uniform. Yeah, that's another thing that I found that's inaccurate. One of the statements I've seen, which are pretty predominant, said that Chris O'Brien, as owner of the team in 1901, bought these used uniforms from the University of Chicago. And a couple things wrong with that. Chris O'Brien was still a teenager, and he he did not own the team. He was just a, a player. Okay. And Amos Alonzo Stagg, the legendary Mm -hmm. grumpy coach of the University of Chicago hated the idea of pro football. And he was one of its biggest attackers in the early twenties when it was starting to to get on its feet. But the name Cardinals actually started in 19, let me think, Oh one when uh, Chris O'Brien and his brother were part of a new athletic club called the Cardinals athletic and social club which was uh, based again in the same neighborhood. So it had nothing to do with the bird or the mm-hmm. color of used uniforms. Uh, never been able to prove uh, that they bought uniforms uh, as a as a social club. Uh, but I, I did find out, and my next book will explain this really uh, deeply, is that a lot of these stories began in the 50s after Chris O'Brien had passed away. Mm. And so we had a very creative marketing staff for the Chicago Cardinals, and that's where a lot of these stories originated. They sound good on paper, but unfortunately, not quite so true. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Chris O'Brien was the first owner Then the second owner was a gentleman, if I have this right, by the name of Dr. David Jones. And he owned the team for such a short period of time. What difficulties did he face and why did he sell the team after such a short period of time? Yeah, it all goes back again. And you're absolutely correct. It was Dr. David Jones. He was the former city physician for the city of Chicago. He had been partners with George Hellas of the Bears and a professional basketball team. And Chris O'Brien was having some financial problems. And uh, after the Grange League, as it's called, started in 1926, 
was the first competition to the Bears and the Cardinals, even though the league was only five or six years old. The new league took over Comiskey Park, where the Cardinals were playing, relegating Chris O'Brien and the Cardinals back to normal park with his small seating capacity. And he was starting to suffer a little bit uh, from lack of attendance simply because more people could not fit in there. Mm. But um, in his autobiography, George Hellis notes that he didn't want the Cardinals to fall into the wrong hands. I've always taken that a couple of different ways. There might have been interest from the Chicago underworld and to mm-hmm. get more involved in professional football. There could have been other individuals that maybe would have um, done something detrimental to pro football. So Hellas, I'm not going to say coerce, but maybe suggested to Dr. David Jones, this would be a good investment. And so uh, in 1928, I believe, Chris O'Brien sold the team for $12,500 to Dr. <laughs> Jones at the behest of George Hallis. And one of the neat things, I, I try and talk about this subject as much as I can, and whoever will have me, but um, Chris O'Brien's granddaughter came to one of the talks last year, and we were talking, and part of my slide is uh, Chris O'Brien sold the team for 12500 It really helped him get out of debt. Today, the team is worth $2.1 billion. And so I felt a little uncomfortable with his granddaughter there. And she said the neatest thing, I apologize. She said, we kind of know Chris was a great football man, but he didn't have that great of a football uh, business sense. So, <laughs> so, so oh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, so that gave Dr. Jones the opportunity to jump in. He had great plans for the Cardinals. He was quoted in the newspaper saying, I think the South side is ready for winning football. He took the team to Coldwater, Michigan for what's believed to be the first out-of-town training camp, brought on Ernie Nevers, the uh, legendary Hall Mm -hmm. of Famer. Mm -hmm. And so it really looked like he was going to turn things around. But after a couple of years, no, people weren't attending the games as much as they would have preferred. And so Again, with the the help of George Hallis, um, Mr. Bidwell at the time, Charles Bidwell was uh, part owner of the Bears and an officer with the organization. And uh, Hallis knew Jones wanted to, to get out and got Bidwell involved. So the Cardinals have been sold twice since 1899, and George Hallis was involved in both sales. Wow. And it's amazing that um, when you look back at the long history of the NFL, now 100 years old, you know, some of the oldest teams, well, the two oldest teams being the Bears and the Cardinals, the Packers coming along, you know, right afterwards, and then the Giants. It's really amazing when you consider the Giants have always been in the Mara family, the Bears have always been in the Hallis family. Yeah. And basically, outside of O'Brien and Jones, the Cardinals have always been in the Bidwell family. They have, yeah, since 1932, I believe. So, yeah, a long time. (laughs) Wow. You know, like I just said, the, the Cardinals and the Bears did come on the scene together. And you were talking about how the Cardinals... Uh, played at a, a a small stadium, and that certainly affected attendance. Even if they were to sell out the small stadium, it didn't fit that many people. So where were the Bears playing, and where did the Cardinals wind up playing so they could attract a larger crowd? And that, again, is another interesting concept. When the Bears moved up from Decatur, Illinois, and got rid of the Decatur Staley's name, became the Chicago Bears. Uh, Hallis made a deal to take over what was called Cubs Park at the time. Again, Wrigley Field now. Mm -hmm. And the Cardinals were in normal park for those first two or three seasons. And then as their crowds were doing better, and and when they would play the Bears, the crowds were maybe over 10,000 at the time. That's when the Cardinals moved over to Comiskey Park, the White Sox Stadium. Um, and they stayed there for uh, several years until Mr. Bidwell got involved. Mm-hmm. And then ironically, the Cardinals 
moved up to Wrigley Field and shared that with the Cubs and the Bears. And the feeling was that the Cardinals might solve their attendance woes by playing at Wrigley Field since the Bears are drawing really nice crowds. But the marketing problem there was the fans on the south side just kind of refused to go up to Wrigley Field and the north side fans already had the Bears. Mm. But it left the Cardinals behind the eight ball in terms of scheduling because the Cubs would be in there until around October 1st. Then the Bears would get first choice of home games. Then the Cardinals. And the Cardinals often would not open up their home schedule state till November when it was cold. And that made it even more of a detriment in terms of encouraging fans to attend. Mm. It was so cold out. But the Cardinals fans were always kind of innovative. If they were cold, it wasn't beyond them to set fire to the bleachers to keep warm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. So, you know... Hallis, in a way, George Hallis, in a way, um, helped the Cardinals survive by suggesting that Jones buy the team from O'Brien and that Bidwell, uh, a partner of his, go ahead and buy the Cardinals. So a couple little questions here. First, how well afterwards, after Bidwell bought the Cardinals, what did the relationship between Hallis and Bidwell develop into? Did they remain friends? Was it a good relationship? And then two, didn't Bidwell somehow return the favor and sort of save the Bears as well? He did. And then let me tackle the second part of that question first. Notice how I definitely put tackle in there for a football (laughs) conversation. (laughs) When, uh, when Hallis moved the team up from Decatur, he had a partner, uh, Dutch Sterneman, uh, also from the University of Illinois, and they were partners. And around the mid-20s, there was some friction developing between them. And finally, it was decided right during the beginnings, I believe it was about 1931, that Hallis would buy out Sterneman for $38,000, and he would own the team completely. So he had a couple of deadlines, one in 1931 and then a couple in 1932, where he had to come up with money. And so he went to people to help him in the Depression, and the Bears really weren't making much money. In fact, Hallis would take a loan out at the beginning of each season to pay off some salaries from the year before, maybe to make a down payment on his his coach Hmm. when he wasn't coaching himself. And so uh, he had to pay him in this money, and he borrowed money from George Trafton's mother, um, one of his friends, and then to come up with the last five thousand. At the time, Charles Bidwell loaned him the money, or came up with the money, and and helped Hellas get over the hump in terms of meeting the deadline, because in the contract, I believe it says that if Hellas did not make his payments on time the assets of the team would revert back to Sterneman and the money that was already paid. So Bidwell basically, yes, was a big factor in helping Hellas raise the money, uh, not only in in donating money himself, but I think he also helped Hellas get a loan, which were very difficult to get back Mm -hmm. there in the early part of the Depression. And and and, and that and that and that loan or you know Bidwell helping Hallis really came at the eleventh hour where did, Hallis yes. was like really truly in jeopardy of losing the team. That's right. And a, and a couple of stories. One says Bidwell paid at one time and another, but the one I like, which I haven't disproved yet, was that Bidwell was a major factor in meeting that final deadline, where Hallis literally had minutes to make his payment. And uh, to save the team for himself. So there was a a very nice cooperative effort going between the two. And they were they continued to be friends. I think the um, uh, the compatibility between the ownerships changed after Bidwell passed away in 47. And a gentleman named Wolfter became kind of the the lead guy. Uh, He married Bidwell's widow, and there was some difficult circumstances between the teams in the 50s. But one of my favorite stories about Charles Bidwell, and as we mentioned, he was a a partner with Talos, so to speak, or a minority owner and an officer. And Mm -hmm. 
one day the Cardinals, uh, I think this was the first game perhaps after Bidwell became the owner. He owns the Cardinals and they're playing the Bears and the Cardinals take a lead. I think it was seven to nothing. And then late in the game, the Bears tied it up and won the game on a last second field goal to defeat the Cardinals 10 to seven. And to which Bidwell supposedly said, oh, that was close, meaning the Bears had a close win over the team he owned. But apparently he got over that. (laughs) (laughs) What was fandom like back then? I mean, one team played in Comiskey, one team played in what we now know is Wrigley. Um, and Comiskey being the old Comiskey Park, what was fandom like? You said that, um, you know, it was it was cold there for the Cardinals and the fans were known to uh, become very creative to keep themselves warm when the right. weather did turn. But what was fandom like? And, and, and was it strictly a North versus South thing that that allowed the Bears to draw perhaps better crowds what was it like my understanding is that the fans really supported their teams back in those days it was a unique situation for one city to have the two teams and with territorial rules for the nfl it likely would be difficult to happen again although it has happened as you know since then especially in new york but uh, the fans truly did not like the other team and the players did not like each other either And so we saw many games where the combatants on the field got involved in many riots as well. Uh, One of the stories is that Ed Sprinkle of the Bears, the meanest man in football, supposedly gave a shot to Charlie Trippi. Both are in the Hall of Fame now, and Charlie Trippi knocked him out. Hmm. And both both, uh, Trippi was ejected, uh, even though both were involved in the fight. And afterwards, Trippi said, yeah, I feel bad about missing the end of the game, but it was worth it. And as I said, fans often would uh, throw things on the field. One of the best examples occurred in 1922. And on the south side, the Cardinals entertained the Bears. And the stars of the team were Patty Driscoll for the Cardinals, the halfback, the kicker, the punter, a great defender. And, and as he was running around the, I believe it was the left end, George Hallis and Dutch and Joey Sterneman, the brother of Dutch Sterneman, tackled Driscoll really hard, threw him to the ground so hard that he almost lost consciousness. <laughs> well, Driscoll jumps to his feet, starts swinging away, and knocks out Joey Sterneman, and then all caca breaks loose, as I like to say. <laughs> the bench is emptied. The players are fighting. Pretty soon the fans come out in the field. The police are called. The mounted police are on the field. And they finally break this up. And uh, supposedly George Hallis was on the ground face down with a fan with a pistol, uh, with the pistol pointed at his head. Oh, wow. And Ed Healy had signed with the Bears just the week before. He was really the first free agent in football coming over from Rock Island. Rock Island season ended. And so Healy had had said in a book years later, he said, oh, my gosh, here I was signing for $100, and I'm out here ready to lose my life. It was the Capone crowd that poured on the field (laughs) to protect their (laughs) idol, Patty Driscoll. Oh, my. (laughs) Oh, my. So that was kind of typical of the Bears-Cardinals games. You never knew what was going to happen. And even when they played an exhibition game in, in the 30s in California, same thing. Players got into a big riot. Fans were on, came out in the field. And it was always unpredictable. But, uh, it was always interesting to see which team would persevere every season. Yeah, for a long time, it was the Bears, though. Mm-hmm. Would Bears fans or Cardinal fans root against the Bears or Cardinals, no matter who they were playing? I think they would because they're in the same division. And the only time perhaps if the Bears fans were near a title and the Cardinals played the Packers, they might root for the Cardinals to Mm. upset the Packers. But yeah, it was that old saying, it's, uh, you know, I'm a Bears fan and I'm always the second fan of whoever is playing the Cardinals. So yeah, pretty true. Yeah. Very similar to the Dodger giant rivalry in New York before the two teams 
moved out to uh, California. What, I think that's what, similar, yep. Yeah, one more thing before we get into uh, uh, the Cardinals in, you know, specifically seasons and players. I read somewhere that there was another team, and you mentioned them already, the Chicago Tigers. Yes. And in 1920, the Tigers and Cardinals played, and the loser had to leave town? Do you know anything about that? Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, research that one, too. It's another great story by the creative minds of the Cardinals marketing staff in the late 40s. <laughs> <laughs> This story did not appear until the late 40s, and it came out in the a game program, I believe, in 1946 or 47. I'm not quite sure, but around that time, and that story started. And, of course, I think members of the Professional Football Researchers Association first tackled that 20 or 30 years ago and said there really was no truth to it. Uh, while the Cardinals had an were incorporated. The Tigers never did. They were members or remnants of the 1919 Hammond Pros team. And uh, they were in Wrigley Field. And uh, there really is no truth because if the, if, the, if the Tigers did lose and have to hand over their franchise, it's likely they would not have continued to play that season, which they did. Mm. And there's no legal record of, of the team changing hands uh, so Chris O'Brien or his uh, corporate friends would take over the Tigers. So another great story, but unfortunately could never find anything about it except that it didn't show up until long after the combatants were gone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Cardinals. Now they certainly had some big name talent, especially early on. And I'm going to mention a few and I would hope you could tell me a little bit about them. And the first two are guys who I actually have done podcasts on, but I'd like to know about their time with the Cardinals. Let's start with Duke Slater. Yeah, Duke Slater, of course, the All-American from Iowa, who finally, thank goodness, is in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, started his pro career with the Rock Island Independents. That team was having difficulties off the field financially. It was run by a small group. A gentleman named Flanagan was running the team for many years. And Slater, thank goodness, uh, came up and joined the Cardinals. Was a real mainstay, a tackle. Uh, just, a, 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 just a strong and agile person in the line who I've read some places where he was just as fast as the quickest halfbacks on the team mm -hmm. but he uh he played with the cardinals for several years of course and never missed a game really uh the only time he missed a game was because of uh racial inequality questions earlier in his career but yeah the, the color cardinals, of the skin the color yep of unfortunately the skin. Yep. yep yep all right um ernie nevers who played for them and later coached for them he did ernie started out on a stanford Great story about him is that he once came out and played in the Rose Bowl, I think, coming off of two broken ankles, but uh, had a relatively short career. He played with the Duluth Eskimos for in 26 and 27. Then in 28, he went back to Stanford and became a assistant coach. And then he was lured back uh, to play for the Cardinals uh, in 29, 30, and 31 but he had his most memorable game in the Thanksgiving day of 29 when he scored 40 points in a 40 to six win over the bears. Mm -hmm. And he gives all the credit to Duke Slater and his line uh, that they opened the holes up for him. But there were some, I guess, some antagonistic words that passed between the two teams earlier in the season when they had a tie game. And so Nevers was never one to shrink away from contact uh, they said he was just so hyped up for that game that um, most and the blocking was so exceptional that he could run into the end zone without being touched, uh, which was a little difficult. Since he was a kicker, he also kicked four extra points. So mm. his 40 points is the oldest single individual NFL record in the books. And his six touchdowns are tied. Uh, Gail Sayers Gail was the Sayers, last to yeah. do it in 1966. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Here's a big name. 
Patty Driscoll. Oh, Patty, what a great player. Only five foot seven, came out of Northwestern, but signed a pro baseball contract and lost the last year of his eligibility. But he spent time with uh, the Hammond Pro Team before World War I. And then he was with Hammond in 1919. But in 1918 is when we first really heard about him nationally. He was part of the Great Lakes Naval Team with George Hellas and Jimmy Councilman, some of the other famous names of the day, that won the Rose Bowl the first time uh, and the last time a collegiate team uh, did not win the Rose Bowl or participate, I believe. Uh, except I think, you know, don't you even during the war, the college teams played. So uh, Patty joined the Cardinals. And for a while, he was all pro just about every year. He was paid the magnificent sum of $300 a game. And this is when some guys were still getting 10 or $25 a game. Wow. But he was well worth it for the Cardinals because of his kicking. And uh, his, he was fast, uh, very evasive. And some of those early all pro teams were always dominated by Patty Driscoll. And he held uh, several records for field goals. He used the old drop kick. When I mentioned that to kids now, I said, yeah, he was a great drop kicker. They look at me like I'm still on my, uh, what do you call it, the Commodore computer. (laughs) (laughs) But Patty made uh, some good money, and uh, he was sold by Chris O'Brien to the Bears after 1926, I believe, or after 1925. But uh, one of the best stories about him was his great punting ability. And when Red Grange came into the league in 1925, his first game, of course, was with the Bears on Thanksgiving Day in 1925 against the Cardinals. And so the Cardinals said uh, they knew Grange's reputation. They didn't, really didn't do scouting reports then, but Patty spent most of the day punting away from Red Grange. I think about 18 times. <laughs> After the game, he was uh, walking off the field next to Grange and Patty's fiance was with him, and Patty said to her, he said, oh, I can't believe they're booing as they all walk by. Why would they boo this young man? And his wife said, no, they're not re- booing Red. They're booing you, Patty. I mean, things <laughs> didn't get Red, and she's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> all right, another big name, Ollie Matson. Well, Ollie, the silver medalist at the 52 Olympics was just a tremendous runner throughout the 50s for the Cardinals. Uh, had that speed, of course. He was a good size back. Uh, he was, of course, traded for, I think, nine players in 1959, which was extraordinary at the mm-hmm. time. And uh, unfortunately, that ended his Cardinals career, but he still continued to play for a few years. But mm-hmm. He was just a genuinely talented guy, and many people don't realize how good he was defensively as well. And uh, so Ollie Matson, I think, is just one of the names that's always going to coincide with the Chicago Cardinals. Mm -hmm. You know, the names that I've mentioned so far, I would think most football fans have at least heard of them. But here's one that I don't think many football fans have, Charlie Trippi. Charlie, yes. Well, it's interesting to note that Charlie was the first bonus baby of the National Football League. Uh, He was being wooed by this new league that was starting up. Uh, In fact, there was another team in Chicago, and there was a team in New York that thought they had him. He was an All-American at Georgia. He was also a great baseball player. He was already playing minor league baseball and doing quite well at that. And the story goes that Charles Bidwell, and this would be in 1947, kind of made a secret agreement with Charlie Trippi that he was going to get this tremendous amount of money, but not to tell anybody about it. And uh, sure enough, Charlie Trippi signed with the Cardinals to the surprise of both the other football league as well as the Major League Baseball, who thought that he would fit quite well with their squads as well. But Charlie uh, could play any position in the backfield and not only a runner, a passer. Uh, he could kick if need be. He played quarterback in the early 50s when Curly Lambeau took over the Cardinals. Mm-hmm. And uh, rightly in the Hall of Fame and still with us, I believe he's now 98 years old. Wow. All right. You, you, said, you said Curly Lambeau. So, again, another name that most football fans are familiar with, 
but I don't think that they are familiar with the name Curly Lambeau because of his connection with the Cardinals. Can you talk about Curly and his time with Chicago? That is true. Well, Curly, of course, developed the Packers from pretty much day one and stayed with them through the end of the 40s. And the Cardinals signed him. And I always ask people a trivia question. Who is the only Cardinals coach to have a stadium named after him? And they'll look (laughs) at each other and wonder, who the heck? I'll say Curly Lambeau. And they'll say, what? He's the Packers coach. But he did come to the Cardinals around 1950, lasted about a season and a half. And he and Charlie Trippi in particular did not get along well. And their stories in the papers and back then the newspapers didn't, eh, they didn't print many rumors or secrets, but the stuff used to ooze out of the locker rooms that Curly wasn't relating well to the team, not showing up for practices, etc. So he was let go midway through his second year towards the end of it, I should say. And uh, but that was a short stint. The Cardinals were not very successful with Curly no. either. No. And it, It came after a hard fall from their 1947 championship. Sure, sure. Dick, Night Train Lane. What a great defender. I mean, he, I think, still holds the NFL record for 14 interceptions in a game, which he achieved as a rookie. How many? How many in one game? Uh, excuse me, one season. <laughs> uh, I was going to say. That would have like, been great. I, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I never heard of that one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's what you get for a guy with no life. Right? <laughs> I embellish stuff. <laughs> so he was with the cards from 54 to 59. Uh, he did something like intercept about 30 passes uh, during that time. But each of those seasons with the Cardinals, he was named – an all pro or an all NFL from somebody, whether it was the league itself or sporting news uh, and continued after he left with the lions. And I know the lions thought mm-hmm. they got a great deal uh, having him on the team when they finally got a hold of him around uh, 1960 or so. So just a, another hall of famer uh, supposed to be the toughest hitter in the fifties. Mm-hmm. If you had night train lane on you, you knew you weren't going to have, you were not going to have a very good day as a receiver. <laughs> I got one other name, and I think almost everybody has heard of him, but I I didn't realize that for one season he played with the Cardinals, Jim Thorpe. That's right. Chris O'Brien had this great idea at the end of 1928 that if he could draw more people, maybe he could make more money. And, of course, this is near the end of his tenure, and he went out with colors. He brought in Jim Thorpe for one game. I think Thorpe was about 42. Of course, people still today argue, how old was Jim Thorpe? Because apparently his uh, exact birthday was still kind of blurry. But he got in the game against the Bears and was unable to do much. Um, There's not a whole lot written about it. I've tried to find better descriptions except the fact that he appeared to be a little overweight. But uh, he did draw a few people into the game uh, back in 1928 for the Cardinals and Still listed forever, Jim Thorpe as a Chicago Cardinal. Mm. You know, the Cardinals and the Bears were pretty darn good back in the early 20s. And um, 1925 was the Cardinals' first championship season. But it certainly didn't come without controversy. They went 11, 2, and 1 but it would be years before they actually accepted the championship. Tell us about the 1925 season and how the championship was decided and all of the issues surrounding it. Yeah, there was a lot of controversy about that season. Basically, if we position the Cardinals and the Pottsville Maroons and Red Grange all in this conversation, Pottsville, of course, out of Pennsylvania. Red Grange joining the Bears a week after he finished his career with uh, the University of Illinois and the Cardinals just chugging along. And Cardinals and Pottsville had the two best records. Grange, of course, came in, and for the first time ever, the Bears sold out Wrigley Field with about 34,000 people there. Hmm. And that was, of course, the time when the idea, now we know it was planned a little earlier, 
that came out that the Grange and the Bears were going to go on a tour, and which proved to be quite successful. They drew about 70,000 in New York for the Giants game. But all these games were kind of crushed in together, so Grange ultimately got hurt, missed a couple games there at the end, which was unfortunate. But most of these were, a lot of these were non-league games. The Bears took a second tour uh, that did well in some towns, didn't do well in others. So the thing was, did people actually want to win the title or did they want a chance to schedule Red Grange and the Bears to get that huge gate? And the Cardinals had that first game on Thanksgiving Day in 1925. Uh, Chris O'Brien took a a fee for that game, which we've learned recently with the availability of new records. I shouldn't say new records, uh, records that uh, Dutch Sternman had kept the financials for the Bears. So we know the Cardinals made a few bucks, but it seems to me that Chris O'Brien was more interested in pursuing a championship, which he had not won yet. And of course, Pottsville uh, had a great team as well. When the Cardinals and Pottsville got together, uh, late in the 1925 season, Pottsville prevailed, and some papers called it the championship game. But in those days, we didn't have a fixed schedule. Teams could schedule as many games as they would like until a certain date. So let's say December 14th of 1925. I'm not sure if that's it or not. Cardinals looking to uh, get that championship scheduled two more games, which was their right to do. They won both although they were against squads that pretty much had evaporated for the season and their easy victories. So this gave the Cardinals a better record. Was it ethical? Probably not, but it was illegal. Yes, it was. It was under the rules. On the other hand, Pottsville had this great team. They wanted to play a, a, a game in uh, the Philadelphia area, which was the territory of Frankfurt, Frankford. And apparently Joe Carr, the commissioner of the league, said that was not legal to play in that territory. But Pottsville did, and Carr expelled them. Expulsed them? Is that the right word? Picked them out of the league. And, uh, <laughs> I think expelled them. <laughs> yeah, expelled. That's the right word. So Pottsville, Pottsville is quite unhappy. And to this day, their fans are unhappy. And there's been a lot of discussion going back and forth over the years. But if the league tossed the team out they were out and the cardinals finished with a better record and at the time the minutes tell us that the league awarded the cardinals the championship but chris o'brien refused it because of the circumstances going on around there chris o'brien was fined a thousand dollars which was big bucks at that time because he scheduled a game and four high school kids from the chicago area played in one of the games uh, they were with the Milwaukee Badgers that came into town. It hasn't been proved that O'Brien specifically knew about these high school players, but he was able to get the game in and thus finish with a better winning percentage than Pottsville. So the NFL never did take away those two extra games. And so the history at the time uh, did say the Cardinals won the championship. It wasn't until Charles Bidwell took over the team that they actually claim the 1925 title. So if you look at the records of the time and the rulings and the minutes, yes, the Cardinals are the 1925 champions. And uh, that's where the controversy will continue, I'm sure, for mm. a long, long time. You know, the one thing that strikes me about the Cardinals and their time in Chicago, and really, if you look through their history, even when they were in St. Louis and now in Arizona, it is a franchise that has never really been able to sustain year after year of success, and particularly early going after 1925. Why? What prevented the Cardinals from building on success and, and being a championship caliber franchise year after year? It seems when Chris O'Brien, we know, lacked the finances to support the team. Once he lost Patty Driscoll, he was unable to attract the real big names. Then Dr. Jones came along, and here we have Ernie Nevers, and so they were competitive again. But when he sold the team to Mr. Bidwell, uh, who seemed to have uh, ample 
ample surpluses to spend on the team, they struggled quite a bit, never quite turned the corner. And there was talk that the team wasn't really willing to put the money into the on-field product. And, of course, that might be a discussion that needs further research. It could be they just had bad luck with draftees and people they signed. Uh, They finally put it all together at the end of the 40s, had two Mm -hmm. phenomenal seasons. And that came, I think, as a result of Bidwell really going out and recruiting, signing Charlie Trippi. They had really bankrolled a lot of talent, players coming back who had been drafted, others who were veterans. And, and pretty soon they had this awesome team. Uh, in 46, they were over 500. But in 47, they won the championship in 48, which I think is the best team in the franchise history. They were 11 and 1 and lost the NFL championship 7 to 0 in what's now called the snowball in Philadelphia. Right. right. So, yeah, hard to say. Uh, hard to say. I, on one hand, you've got the Cardinals offering a bucket of money to Trippy. And other times you hear guys saying, uh, you know, they, they can't even afford to do this. Pat Summerall, I know, remember reading about him saying that the team was sometimes a little bit on the economical side. And other times, for example, after the 1948 All-Star game in Chicago, that the Cardinals took the whole team and their family for a long weekend at a very nice resort Mm. and paid for everything. Mm. Other players said when they traveled by train, it was always first class. They had a sleeper car. So just don't know. Uh, But the fifties were one of the worst decades, if not the worst ever for a professional football team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When the Cardinals struggled, particularly again, after 1925 and before we get into the, to the 1940s, what was attendance like? What was it like being a Cardinals fan, especially when you look on the other side of town and the Bears were experience, experiencing success? Yeah, and it's right. They were in Comiskey Park, but traditionally did not draw over 20,000 people. Um, if you look at example in the 30s, if they had a crowd of uh, 10,000, it was usually an away game. I know the Packers brought in 9,000 and uh, the Bears normally would they would draw over 10,000. Um, but the crowds were very low. Uh, they did okay on the road. For example, in 1936, they drew as low as 1,500 people when the Eagles came to town. Wow. So it was just, you can't do much. And you can draw, say, 32,000 at the Giants and then 1,500 at home. And the contracts at the time would allow for either a guarantee, uh, which wasn't too much for the teams, or uh, a percentage of the gate. So often it looks like the Cardinals would take that percentage of the gate. And things changed around there in the late 40s, though, when sure. the Bears and the Cardinals got together, uh, over 50,000. They played in front of 70,000 in Los Angeles with the Rams in 47. Of course, the on-field product was good. So every game, pretty much, they had a big crowd, even in the exhibition games. uh, 40,000 came out to watch a game with the Giants in early September. So uh, the attendance was not strong, much better on the road than at home for some reason. Mm -hmm. Joe, we're going to jump ahead a little here to the 1940s, the early 1940s. And I find that to be a very interesting time in professional football during the war years. The NFL somehow was able to carry on, but they really needed cooperation from all the teams. And the teams needed cooperation from each other to put a product on the field. Yes. And they formed partnerships. In 1944, the Cardinals and Steelers formed a partnership combining the two teams, and they called them Card Pit. And that was really during a very down time for Chicago. How bad were they? And by the way, I also saw where Card Pitt, the combo team of the Cardinals and the Pittsburgh Steelers, they were so bad. Their nickname was actually the Carpets. Yeah. Um, they, yes. the, and, and that was also during a time when the Cardinals lost 29 games in a row. How bad were the Cardinals? <laughs> the teams were so bad. 
I know uh, Chet Bulger, who was a tackle for the Cardinals uh, around 43 and continued through uh, the championship years, said it was just awful to go out there knowing you had very little chance of winning. But they lost 10 games in 43 as the Cardinals. And then in 44, they lost every single game as part of the, the card pits, part Cardinal, part Pittsburgh. And it was just a, a team that really lacked talent. The war had decimated the squads. The reason the Cardinals and Pittsburgh got together was that the request of the Bears and the Cardinals to combine was turned down because they thought the league thought they would have too powerful of a team. Uh, that the other teams would not be competitive. So instead, we were left with the card pits. And, uh, <laughs> and they were the pits. Yes, and, and you're exactly right. The Chicago Tribune wrote an article towards the end of the season and said, let's not call them the card pits, call them the carpets. And why not? <laughs> Everyone walks all over them. Interesting, funny stuff. But shortly after that downtime in Cardinals history, they put together, not necessarily record-wise, but the best campaign in franchise history, 1947. Before we get to what they did on the field, we do have to mention, though, it started on a downer. Bidwell passed away before the season started. What an... What 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 an awful thing. Well, when anybody dies, it's awful. But here this guy is trying to build a team to win a championship, and it's about to happen, and he never gets to see it. So tell us a little more about Charles Bidwell, and then let's get into 1947. Sure, yeah. And kind of unusual because the players really adored Bidwell. I mentioned Chet Bulger, a funny guy, and I was just really fortunate to meet him years ago. And he said they they enjoyed Bidwell so much, and he was very fair to them that they called him Blue Shirt Charlie. He would wear dark blue shirts, sometimes with a yellow tie, I think. And uh, so one day the players said they'll have fun with Mr. Bidwell. They all dressed for a road trip on the train with dark blue shirts yellow tie (laughs) they all pulled in they're all sitting in the crane train compartment and the owner walks in he says what the heck is going on who dressed you guys get those things off they're gonna think we're a bunch of gangsters (laughs) kind of cool for him to do that but yeah he died rather suddenly in the spring of 1947 uh, it led to some chaotic ownership down the road but that year i think things really fell into place because of his influence. And as we talked previously, his recruitment of Charlie Trippy, his fairness to the players that are returning. And one of the neatest things about him, you may have heard this story about Mats Tonelli, who was a player for the Cardinals and uh, I think 39 or 40. He enlisted into the service before the war started and was unfortunately stationed when the war broke out in the Philippines and was part of the Bataan death march. Mm. He spent the entire war in uh, Japanese captivity under horrible circumstances. Anyway, uh, I think in August of uh, 45, he was finally released, made his way home, put him right in the hospital. And here was this 210 fullback from Notre Dame who had gone down to about 90 pounds. And he said one of the first visitors he had was Mr. Bidwell. Hmm. And he went up, saw Mats Tonelli and said, Mats, uh, you know, when you left, you had just signed your contract with the Cardinals. We expect you to honor your contract. And Mats said, uh, you know, I, I can't play right now. And Bidwell just looked at him and said, well, I know you'll do your best to get out on the field. So towards the end of the season, he did make an appearance against the Packers. And because of that, uh, he qualified for the meager pension or whatever benefits the players got in those days. He got credit for his entire wartime from 1940 to 1945 or 41 to 45. Wow. Uh, Bidwell came and 
and encouraged him to take the field. And since he did, he got those benefits. So wow. he said, no, I'll always be grateful to Mr. Bidwell and, uh, and to the Cardinals for doing that. So. Mm -hmm. Now, this 47 team had the million-dollar backfield, and we've discussed a little bit about Charlie Trippy. Now, I read somewhere that by beating the Chicago Rockets of the All-America Football Conference, the new league, and Chicago now had three teams, the Bears, the Cardinals, right. and the Rockets, by beating the Rockets in an exhibition game, the Cardinals won the rights to Trippy. Is there any truth to that? And if so, can you elaborate on the whole situation? Yeah, the, the Rockets started in 46. They were around for four seasons. They were really horrible. I think in 47 and 48, they were 1-13. and 13. They played at Soldier Field, this mammoth stadium uh, on the lakefront in Chicago. Like the Cardinals played there in 1948 when the champions of the NFL would play the college all-stars every August. And 101,220 showed up. Mm. The biggest crowd ever to see the Cardinals play. And so here's the Rockets already fighting with two other teams, did not draw well. So they were kind of doomed. But the two teams, as far as I know, never played each other unless it was in a scrimmage. Um, they uh, kind of did their best to avoid each other <laughs> with the competing leagues that they were. Mm -hmm. And the Rockets disappeared after the 49 season. But it was and another interesting aspect of that was the guy who founded the all-star game, Arch Ward, mm -hmm. who was the uh, editor of the Chicago Tribune. He was also the one who pretty much put the players together, meaning the owners, et cetera, for this new, uh, a AFC, as they called it, football. He, he also created the uh, baseball all-star game, I he think. He did. He yeah. did, yeah, in the 30s. So here were the Cardinals coming into the all-star game, finally getting some recognition in the summer of 48. And Arch Ward uh, wanted the champions of his league to play the all-stars. And uh, he gave the go-ahead, and the Cardinals thought they were going to get edged out of the opportunity to play. But – the board of directors of the Chicago Tribune said, no, our agreement and understanding is with the National Football League. And so that really hurt Arch Ward and his new league. But, um, yeah, the, the Rockets simply could not compete with two other pro teams. And I don't know if I don't think it hurt the Cardinals or the Bears either, because in those years is when the Cardinals really started drawing well for home games and drawing well means in over 30,000 at Comiskey Park for some of their games and 47 and 48 and a big crowd of 77,000 at, well, at Los Angeles. So and the annual meetings with the bears, whether they played once, once or twice, it was usually around 50,000 people attended that. So I think the Rockets just got dumped in the wrong place at the wrong mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. But how did the Cardinals win the rights to Trippy? That was the work solely of Mr. Bidwell. He struck up a friendship with Charlie Trippy. Mm. He met with him. Trippy was coming out of the service in the, in the University of Georgia. He was they had the opportunity to play pro baseball or pro football with the new league, with the American Football Conference, with the All American Football Conference, and. They thought they had him wrapped up. I think it was a New York team thought for sure that uh, Trippy was going to sign with them. They offered him big bucks, but Bidwell beat him to it and uh, kind of told Charlie uh, to keep it secret. And when they announced it, it did certainly wake up the football world that they had gotten this uh, bonus baby, so to speak, mm -hmm. and making the kind of money that, that Charlie Trippy was about to make. And the players were happy. Uh, although they demanded that he bought dinner when they go out. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the million dollar backfield, Paul Christman, Charlie Trippy, Elmer Angsman, and Pat Harder. Yeah. The original million dollar backfield, and the name came from was the first time that there were four all Americans from colleges playing in the same backfield for the pros. So the original uh, dream backfield was Paul Christman from Missouri, Pat Harder from Wisconsin, Charlie Trippy from Georgia, and Marshall Goldberg from the University of Pittsburgh. And Goldberg, in the 1947 season, started switching over specifically to defense. He was really one of the 
uh, predominant defensive players of those years and one of the defensive specialists. And that's where Elmer Engsman from Mount Carmel High School in Chicago and Notre Dame slipped in and became part of the dream backfield and was a, really a great asset to it. And my favorite story about Engsman is when he was at Notre Dame one time, I think they were playing Navy, he had several teeth knocked out. And uh, he went over to the sideline and they said, you're not going to play anymore. We're going to get this fixed. He insisted on going into the game and playing some more. And when the Cardinals heard about it, Jimmy Councilman, the coach said, hey, that Angsman playing like that, that's the kind of guy I want on our team. <laughs> and he was a tough one. They used to say he'd put his false teeth in before the game, get taped up. He wore glasses, so he had these early contacts, apparently, and uh, he was ready for battle. So, yeah, the Dream Backfield then uh, had these four or five talented runners on the team. Uh, all of them, as I said, uh, became All-Americans, that original four, and and so it worked out well for the Cardinals. They could promote that throughout the season. And again, marketing efforts were pretty meager at the time, but as they had with wanting to see red grains, they wanted to see Charlie Trippy, and they wanted to see this dream backfield in action. And they were all great players. Crispin broke all the quarterback records while he was with the team. Harder led the NFL in scoring. Uh, Goldberg, as I mentioned, was a defensive standout after his All-American career at Pittsburgh. And, of course, Trippy, uh, another Hall of, Hall of Famer, uh, could do just about anything. Mm -hmm. So. It was uh, a really a gift to the Chicago fans to be able to see them all in the field at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that 47 season was special. The Cardinals went nine and three and they beat the Eagles 28 to 21 in the championship game. Tell us about 47, how good the team was and uh, yeah, the game they, against the Eagles. Yeah. The, the, they had what they, the players later told me they had two championship games. The first was on December 14th against the Bears, and they had to beat the Bears in order to make sure they qualified, and uh, they beat them quite handily, but they had a trick play they worked on, and uh, Babe Dementia was the guy that was supposed to run out in a, a strange against a strange opponent of the Bears, wasn't used to covering them, and his wife had a baby that week, so he didn't get to practice it, but they went out, first play of the game, they completed this long touchdown defeated the Bears in front of about 48,000 to qualify for the game with the Eagles, which was going to be a home game at Comiskey Park. Of course, uh, with the Cardinals' luck, it was cold weather, little snow, frozen field. A couple of years ago, I shouldn't say a couple of years ago, a few years ago, I ran into a guy who was kind of the clubhouse manager of the Cardinals, and he was the one, he claimed, that saw that the Eagles were wearing illegal spikes mm. to contradict the frozen field, the frozen tundra. <laughs> and he went and told Jimmy Councilman, and Councilman quietly told his players to switch into gym shoes or sneakers. And then when the Eagles got their first drive going, he alerted the officials to the eagle, illegal spikes that the Eagles were wearing. So uh, Trippy scored twice, Angman scored twice, and the Cardinals won 28-21 to to finally get that championship after 22 years. And like you said, the following season, 1948, take away the championship game, that might have actually have been the greatest season in the history of this franchise that is played in Chicago, St. Louis, and Arizona. The Cardinals went 11-1. and one. Talk about how great that season was and how bittersweet the ending was with the loss to Philadelphia seven to nothing in that miserable snowstorm. Well, I agree. It was the best season in the history of the franchise. They started out the season with that exhibition against the all stars in front of 101,000 people gave them national pro uh, prestige and prominence. They, uh, blasted the Redskins in Denver. And when they started the league, they kind of rolled along for several games, scored 63 against the Giants, a lone loss of 28 to 17 to the Bears, but there were still almost 53,000 there. Wow. And they, they rolled on defeating the Bears again at the end of the season to qualify for that championship game against the Eagles. And ironically, the weather was not bad the day before. Then it started snowing during the night. 
And uh, I know NFL Films has done a, a great thing about this game years ago where players from the Eagles had to kind of walk and take streetcars part of the way. They couldn't drive to the stadium. The snow was so heavy. And both teams had great runners. Of course, the Cardinals with their still had their dream backfield, and the Eagles had Steve Van Buren. Mm-hmm. And uh, Van Buren scored the only touchdown when the Cardinals – fumbled and they're deep in their own territory and lost seven to nothing. So uh, there's films existing of that game and you can just see how heavy that snow was. And again, I like to point out how unique that football was pro football was in 1948 before the game. Members of both teams went out and shoveled the field and helped pull the tarps off so they could play. Can you imagine wow. some of the day doing that? <laughs> not, not on your life. <laughs> wow. So 47, they go nine and three. They win the championship. 48, they go 11 and one. They unfortunately lose the championship. After the 48 season, it was really downhill. In 49, the Cardinals go 6-5-1. and one, And then they followed that with campaigns where they won five games and three games and one game. I think they had one winning season where they went 7-5. and five. But the 50s were truly a down decade. Um, what happened? How did this team tank so quickly? Oh, it was so fast. I think a lot has to do with Jimmy Councilman retiring from football after the 49 season. They tried dual head coaches in 49, excuse me, after 48 is when Councilman left. Uh, Buddy Parker and Phil Handler switched head, uh, shared head coaching responsibilities in 49. You know, they still weren't that bad, but 6-5-1 and one's a big fall from 11-1. and one. Sure. And then Curly Lambeau came in for a couple of years. Uh, by 1953, they won one game. Uh, three or four times during that decade. They only won twice each year. And it really was one of the most atrocious one-loss records for an NFL team during a single decade. Yeah, they won something like 33 games the entire decade. But players were retiring. The the 47 team, those guys had already been through the war and they had been in college like Marshall Goldberg and uh, even Paul Christman. Lambeau released him pretty much outright, even though he said he uh, so traded him. And a lot of the Pat Harder went to Detroit. Chad Bulger left. Trippy was really the only one who stayed an Angsman with the Cardinals through a, a lot of those year, early years of the early 50s. So, but they did get Ollie Matson, and um, but he was a lone bright spot throughout the 50s. Mm-hmm. I think and they trained Lane on defense. They just never could put it together. They couldn't find a consistent quarterback. Uh, it was 1950. Jim Hardy, the quarterback, threw eight interceptions in one game. And the next game, he threw six touchdown passes. But <laughs> his performances were like the team, very inconsistent throughout the 50s. Mm-hmm. Was fan apathy so bad? Did fans just stop coming out? I mean, what ultimately led the Cardinals to saying, we we just can't stay in Chicago anymore. Yeah, the the crowds were rarely above twenty thousand at Comiskey Park, and by the time they they pay for the rental and expenses, and again, TV was starting, but there wasn't a big windfall from television income, so uh, there wasn't a whole lot more than attendance. So if you could bring in fifty thousand or forty thousand, you're doing a lot better than playing before seventeen or twenty thousand, as the Cardinals were from a lot of those years. So. They were kind of running out of money, didn't have the money to spend. And that's where some of the stories we hear uh, from Pat Summerall, et cetera, that the Cardinals basically couldn't afford much. They just had to keep things going, unfortunately. And uh, that finally prompted the team to uh, look around. They started looking around in the 40s, actually, at possible landing spots. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were going to move. In 1959, they played two games in Minneapolis, which – Drew okay, I think, in the 20,000s or so. But uh, it was it was a difficult goal for the team throughout the decade. The Bears were still drawing, drawing very well, um, doing pretty good. Hellas stepped away for a couple of years. And Teddy Driscoll, the old Cardinals guy, was the head coach of the Bears. Mm-hmm. In 56 and 57. But 
They didn't win any titles either. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, you know, well, leagues never want their teams to leave a city. And there's usually some pretty significant relocation fees. So the NFL was no different. And they had pretty large relocation fees. And Lamar Hunt led a consortium of men who wanted to buy the team, but the Bidwells didn't want to sell. So the NFL engineered a deal that ultimately saved the Bidwells the relocation fee. They go on to move to St. Louis, and the AFL came about. So if you really think about it, in a way, the Cardinals actually helped form the American Football League. What can you tell us about that crucial time in Cardinals history? Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, Lamar Hunt did want to buy the team. There were offers from San Francisco and I think from uh, Atlanta also. And if the NFL was going to expand uh, into those areas, uh, there was probably some encouragement for the Cardinals to do so. George Ellis, of course, would prefer to have the team out of there because with television starting up at the late 50s or becoming more prominent, we had what was called blackouts. Mm -hmm. where if a team was playing at home and one was playing on the road, you couldn't televise the games. It was uh, really an archaic rule that finally went away, but not for many years. And so the NFL was also interested in expanding to St. Louis to keep the AFL out of there. And so it looked finally like it would be a deal that the uh, Cardinals might go there. But instead of charging the Cardinals to move, the NFL, and I've seen this in a couple of reputable spots, paid the Cardinals to move. And huh. there's some sources that said that George Hellas paid a lot of it, but it was supposed to be a half million dollars, which was big bucks back in 1960. Sure. And so they did go to St. Louis in, in March of 60. But by that time, the relationship between Hallis and Walter Wolfner, who was running the Cardinals, had really disintegrated. And there was really no cooperation there. Uh, I was fortunate to, to talk to uh, Bill Bidwell before he passed in the preparation of my book. And basically, he said it was because of television. And it made a lot of sense with that blackout rule they had in place that uh, the NFL couldn't continue to grow if people couldn't watch the games at their leisure. Then ironically, George Hallis was one of the early ones to say, who would sit home and watch a football game on a little square box in their <laughs> living room? <laughs> I think wow. that was in 49. <laughs> wow. You know, it, it's really interesting. You got to wonder, had the Bidwells sold the team to Lamar Hunt, if the AFL would have ever gotten off the ground? You wonder because he was so prominent in the start of that league and with the team, et cetera. Uh, and that's a good one. I have never thought about that. But yeah, I think right. like like you said, you have no life. I think of these weird things, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joe, what is the legacy of the Chicago Cardinals? And does anyone in Chicago know about the Cardinals and the fact that Chicago was once home to three professional football teams at one time? Yeah, it's it's may be difficult to comprehend, but uh, for those outside the city, there's still a lot of people who love the Cardinals 60 years later. Wow. No, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not saying there are people maybe attended the games, but their children or grandchildren. Um, we do these talks around the area and people always have a story. I ran into a 98 year old World War II veteran who was at the Cardinals Bears game on December 7th, 1941. And he was telling me wow. his reaction because they didn't, they did not announce it at the game that the Pearl Harbor was bombed, but he was talking more about how exciting it was to be at that game against the Bears and his Cardinals were playing. And that's all he could talk about when he got home. People were saying, what, didn't you hear the news? Didn't you hear the news? But uh, there's some now that will say, yeah, because their father, uh, we can't say this in Chicago, likes the Packers now because the Cardinals are gone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's still quite a few. Uh, we have a little website that, uh, or a Facebook site on the Cardinals that uh, people really enjoy. And 
um, contribute stuff where they're mostly talking about what their fathers would say or their grandfathers. But yeah, it's hard to believe 60 years later that there's interest in the team and a very, very knowledgeable people. Probably they don't remember the Chicago Rockets and they don't remember the Chicago Bulls. So when the football team in 1926, but uh, they do remember the Cardinals. So it's, mm. it's quite interesting. Mm hmm. Well, Joe, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to join me on Sports Forgotten Heroes. This has been really enjoyable. And, um, geez, I hope you would consider coming back on Sports Forgotten Heroes, and we'll talk about something else. Warren, that would be great. Thank you again for the opportunity to talk about my favorite subject. And of course, I said I have no life, so you got <laughs> stuck with all of it today. <laughs> it was great having you, Joe. Thank you so much. Thank you. When a team leaves a city, it's a horrible thing. It leaves a void. It affects the psyche of the town. They have failed. They no longer have a team to call their own. In some instances, businesses are so negatively affected they have to close their doors. But in the case of the Chicago Cardinals, as sad as it was for their loyal following, Chicago still had the Bears. So I don't think the impact was as bad as, say, when the Cardinals left St. Louis and moved to Arizona. But yet, as Joe pointed out, there are still many Chicagoan fans that remember and love their Cardinals. While in Chicago, the Cardinals compiled a record of 162 wins, 258 losses, and 25 ties. They also won two championships. But the amount of losing hurt. In fact, in their 40 years in Chicago, the Cardinals posted just 11 winning seasons and had five seasons in which they won just one game and had two seasons, which were back-to-back, -back, in which they went 0-10. I want to thank Joe for joining me on this edition of Sports Forgotten Heroes and to all of you for listening. And I'll see you next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football, Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s, Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports, Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.